All right, welcome to part two of the analysis on the September-October NSDA Public Forum Resolution, which is that the United States federal government ought to pay reparations to African Americans. So the first one of these focused more on general topic rather than wording. This one's focusing mainly on various pro-arguments and various questions about pro people have had. I'm going to try to deal with the most common ones of those in as timely a manner as I can, grouping relevant stuff where possible. So one of the first questions, one of the more common questions I've been getting is just, what do you think of the housing contention? What do you think of arguments about housing discrimination, about redlining? And in general, I think it's a pretty good argument that tends to illustrate what makes a good pro-argument. So I'll start with that, so we can kind of use it as comparison for other stuff as we go through. So this can be run talking about the FHA. This is something that has roots in farther back in the past, but that definitely affects people in the present day, that has a quantifiable financial harm associated with it, that has other larger, harder to quantify harms that also were caused by it, and the government can be directly linked to. So I think it's kind of near the core of the topic for the pro on this resolution. If you look at the Coates article in The Atlantic, it's one of the first instances that it gives of something that reparations could be used for. And this can be dealing with the way the GI Bill was implemented. If you want to talk about it in the context of separate protections under the 14th Amendment, it can be talked about in terms of just the Federal Housing Authority in the 1930s. It can be talked about in terms of more recent discrimination in the private sector that was pioneered by and encouraged by things the federal government did. But it's useful in that sense in that it's both something the federal government did directly do, but at the same time something that probably not only the federal government owes reparations on, which makes it a little bit easier to sidestep price tag questions and focus more on the question of obligation or of guilt. So I definitely think that pro teams can do well running housing. I don't think that you need to necessarily specify housing vouchers, and I think that it is stronger when you don't try and do so through a colorblind program. This is something that happens with education vouchers as well, and just in general, there's not too much benefit for pro teams specifically to advocate vouchers. Vouchers aren't going to cost any less than actual money in the majority of circumstances, and if they do, it's because people aren't using them. Furthermore, the money that's being used is not being paid to African Americans, they are being given paperwork which allows them to have the federal government pay money to someone else who usually either owns low-rent housing or owns a charter school that happen to donate money to the politician in question. The only other noticeable difference to vouchers is vouchers say, we don't trust you to spend this money wisely, we're going to tell you what you have to spend it on. So at that point, I'm not sure that for either housing or education that vouchers are necessarily adding anything to the debate for pro, which wants to focus more on the question of, are reparations owed, then what is the optimal form of reparations to pay? So in terms of education, because that's also kind of relevant here, we can look at this and again kind of tie it back into the federal government. Not necessarily so directly, but it still can be done. There was not really a specific department of the federal government analogous to the FHA for education, but at the same time, the whole premise the federal government was pretending between Plessy versus Ferguson and Brown versus Board of Education was that separate really was equal. And if the federal government knew that separate was not equal during that time, then they are probably culpable. Whether this is a question of simply gross incompetence in not realizing that segregation wasn't equal, or this is a case of malice in knowing segregation wasn't equal, in either case, you can make the argument for compensation being owed. So when you were looking at education, you could also tie it back a lot farther. You can look back to as far back as 1836, and the federal government specifically decided to take a hands-off approach to, with the gag rules in terms of allowing states to forbid free or enslaved African Americans to learn to read and criminalizing teaching that. So that's where a lot of differences in education started, and you can certainly go ahead from there and look at what's going on in the present day. I would not get caught up in trying to provide free preschool to everybody or trying to spend my money on inner city schools 
because again, if you can do it in a colorblind way, then it's probably simply good social policy rather than a reparation paid to African Americans for something done wrong in the past. If you are giving it to other minorities as well, and you are giving it to poor white people as well, regardless of what happened to them in the past, then it's not a reparation for something, it is simply a good idea, and it is probably not what you want to defend on pro, even aside from the whole mess of whether or not something is a plan. So another question that I've gotten is just how far back in time do you want to go? How far back do you want to look? Do you want to start all the way in the past with slavery? Do you want to look at things affecting people in the present day? And I think the answer really is a little bit of both. I don't want to just focus on slavery because if I do that, then I run into some difficulty in terms of who actually gets the reparations, what is commensurable, and am I putting a price tag on slavery? If I focus just on the present day, it's much easier to find things that you can actually have corresponding reparations for, that you actually have some kind of legal case for, but even beyond that, there's just the whole idea of this is directly affecting people who I as a judge know, therefore I'm less inclined to believe the it was too long ago, or it was too indirect, or what's done is done arguments, if we're talking about, for instance, somebody I know whose father would have been eligible for education and a house under the GI Bill, but instead got turned down because of race, and as a result, the family's in a very different position, especially post-2008 housing crisis, than someone would have been otherwise. So I think that the more present-day stuff certainly makes it more relatable to judges, but at the same time, I do think you really want to tie it back and explain how a lot of this still has its roots in what the system started out with. So aside from that, I think that the whole issue of looking at the past is just very important for pro teams. I think that any pro team who starts by talking about these will be the benefits that reparations give the government is kind of missing the point of reparations. You can absolutely use that as turns when the con team brings up drawbacks, brings up disadvantages, but I don't think that that should be your initial justification or you're functionally conceding two important framework debates. The prescriptive versus prohibitive framework debate, which we talked about in the last one, does this argument say that we should never have reparations or does it say how these reparations should be implemented? And the backwards looking versus forwards looking debate, do we care about reparations because of what in the past justified them or because of what effect they will have in the future? And I think you kind of give up both of those when you focus too much on how the government benefits or how society benefits on the pro side. Finest turns, probably not good in your own case. Another question I've gotten is about torts, takings, constitutional obligations, legal obligations. Just, can we really build a case that legally the USFG must pay reparations? And I think that while these contentions can be written out, the authors are usually engaging in wishful thinking, and frankly, the legal basis for them just isn't all that strong. I think that generally speaking, you're better off arguing in terms of right and wrong than legality or illegality. The US government has paid reparations in the past for things that were completely legal when it did them. Take Japanese internment, for instance. Korematsu lost his case. Strict scrutiny was upheld. A compelling state interest was proven. Admittedly, this was done by a huge amount of perjury, but at the same time, the government did not break any laws. There are also the twin hurdles of sovereign immunity and statutes of limitations to deal with here as well. And I think that if you start making it into a legal framework on pro, you give con ground that they don't necessarily deserve to have, make them work for that ground, don't start out by giving it to them. I've also heard it just more abstract, it's broken social contract promises, and I think that that is probably a stronger way to run this same argument. I think it is fine to say that the Constitution is a document which lays out what the USFG ought to do. The preamble lays out what it is meant to do, the articles lay out what it has to do, and then the amendments, particularly the first ten, the Bill of Rights, lay out what it may not do, what it ought never do. 
And I think that if you can set those up and talk about broken promises in an explicit contract, that people who pay taxes and follow laws should at least expect the government to obey the Constitution when dealing with them, is something that you can use to argue there is some kind of obligation there. There's not necessarily a strict precedent for violate this many amendments, get this many dollars of reparations, but in terms of explaining broken promises of the government, I think this argument gets a lot stronger than many of the other things that pro teams are tossing around right now. And again, I think this wants to tie into the malice versus negligence or incompetence double bind that I talked about earlier. For instance, with the 15th Amendment. In 1865, it became illegal to deny someone the ability to vote on the basis of race. In 1890, people were arguing specifically, we are passing these voter literacy laws, we are passing these poll taxes, we are passing these other various hurdles specifically for the purpose of stopping black people from voting. And then this went to court and the court said, yes, seems okay to me. I don't think this is violating any laws. And again, when asked, why are you doing this? The answer was to stop black people from voting. And the government said, no, no, we don't think this violates the 15th Amendment. So at that point, whether it is for total incompetence and in understanding the 15th Amendment, or whether it is just malice in not wanting to enforce the 15th Amendment, in either case, there's the idea that reparations would probably be an appropriate remedy. So from there, Another question we have asked what the kind of deals with this comes with the way the 13th Amendment has developed over time. So again, in the status quo, there are more black people locked up in prison than were enslaved. One in every three black men is going to end up in jail at some point during his life. If people are accused of the same crime, the black person is more likely to be convicted. If people are convicted of the same crime, the sentence is going to be more severe or longer for the black defendant the vast majority of the time. And the idea that this is kind of creating a new slavery system through the prison industrial complex can be a strong argument for pro. It actually runs into more definitional trouble than it runs into teleological trouble. And what I mean by that is it tells a very strong story of a wrong that is being done that needs to be fixed. What it does not do is necessarily show how reparations are the appropriate remedy. Reparations are generally for something that happened in the past. Germany paid reparations to Israel in the 1950s. If Germany had attempted to pay reparations to the Jews in 1943 or 1944, people would have been justified in saying, no, those aren't reparations. You have to stop the thing you are doing first or they don't count. And I think that pro teams can overplay their hand on this point by arguing that we're not at the point where reparations are actually what matter yet. So while it can be a strong argument, I don't think it is the strongest argument. I think that if you're going to talk about the 13th Amendment, you want to talk about it in terms of the 14th Amendment, that the protections guaranteed by the 13th Amendment are not then being upheld according to the equal protection clause of the 14th Amendment. And if you do that, then you may as well just run a 14th Amendment argument anyway and try and tie the 13th into it afterwards. Aside from that, another question that I got was, is this a strict deontology topic? Can I run deontology against con teams without straying into abuse? And I think you can. I think there are a couple ways to do this. The first is to talk about how we have to look at this on a moral level. We can't just ask, are reparations good? We have to ask, do we owe reparations for something? So we have to have at least one of those debates. The question is, should we have both of these debates in a public forum format? When we have two minute speeches and we already have to debate moral obligation, there's no way around that. Should we also debate plans and should we also debate solvency? And it's pretty easy to explain to most judges, no, it's better to debate one thing in depth and understand it than to blip three different debates when nobody's really going to come out ahead on any one of them. The second part is just to show that both sides can win and to be able to explain our job as pro is to show that they ought to pay something, that they owe something. Khan's job is to show that they can't pay something, that they ought not pay something, or 
that what they ought pay is not reparations. And there are different ways that con teams can do that. There are many con contentions that can do this, but con shouldn't just say, oh, it costs too much. And at the point at which we are haggling about the price of reparations, we have conceded that we probably do owe something. It is just a question of whether or not it is affordable and whether or not it is feasible. Another argument that I've gotten questions about is the five thirds of a vote article that came up recently in terms of that kind of reparation. I'm not convinced it is a smart article for pro teams to be using in their cases. I think that generally speaking, it is more written for the purpose of let me show how clever I can be with what these statistics would mean than in terms of an actual relevant remedy. I think that even if it were to be a remedy, it is a remedy that is strictly forward-looking, and again, that gives up more frame of the contention gains, and I think that even if it were to be considered a reparation, it would not be a reparation that was being paid. So I personally would try and steer clear of this. I think that it also kind of triggers a lot of the knee-jerk reactions in judges who are opposed to this resolution and makes them come to the forefront in ways that kind of a more reasoned genealogical approach of these are recent offenses that affect people living today, these are how they affected the people they would have inherited their wealth from, this is how this is entrenched in our society, doesn't necessarily do. Another question I got was just the idea of discursive solvency. What do we mean by that? What does it actually do? Where do we look at this from? There's plenty of authors who talk about this, and again, the end of the Coates article in The Atlantic, which pretty much every pro team should at least be reading, and if not referencing directly, looking up some of these sources in and referencing, the idea that these will spur conversation in a useful way. That conversation might already be happening in a bad way, or that conversation might not be happening at all, but the idea that when we look towards this, starting with an apology or starting with some kind of payments, that it forces a dialogue in a way that makes things better. And I think that this is stronger when we talk about this in terms of the status quo as an ongoing dynamic derivative rather than as a static point somewhere on a slope. That the status quo is not the frozen moment of race relations in America right now, but that the status quo is the way that things are changing. How much is racism improving? How much is racism getting worse? How much is equality improving? How much is inequality widening right now? And that kind of status quo is what we want to look at. And if we can show that without reparations, things are not getting better right now, then I think that Pro can certainly say, well, we might as well roll the dice. All of Khan's arguments about bad discourse, all of Khan's arguments about bad stereotypes, these are things that are happening right now, there's backlash right now, so on and so forth, but that we can actually make a lot of the things that are going to be better through discourse. And this is also a strong argument for Pro because it can short circuit a lot of the con team's internal links. And what I mean by that is a lot of con's links assume a world where discourse has not changed, where discourse is controlled by the same people as in the status quo, and Pro can certainly find articles about how they can actually shake this up. Again, this shouldn't be about we solve racism. You don't. This should be more about which side's world shows more improvement. Is Pro part of the solution or part of the problem? Is cons doing nothing going to somehow make things better, or are things going to inevitably keep declining, stay worse, never become equal? Last thing for Pro, and this wasn't even really a question so much as something that I think a lot of teams should have been asking. I think that Pro teams need to find a way to justify why we pay. Because con teams are going to be good at explaining to a judge why this is not that judge's fault. Maybe it's not the con team's fault. Maybe they're not white or black. Maybe they immigrated here afterwards. Maybe their ancestors never owned slaves. If these things are true, many judges are going to decide the round on the implicit question the con team offers them of, do you deserve the life you have right now, or are you just profiting from slavery? Should you have to pay people back for your success? And I think that's very hard for a lot of pro teams to answer, 
And I think that how pro teams deal with that, how they actually explain the way government works, how they actually explain why people came to this economy, what the economy was built on, or how we pay other old debts will become very important for that. Tune in for part three on Con soon.